I'd like to thank Pastor Ben for this opportunity to talk to you from the Pope, from his pulpit. Those are beautiful flowers. Yes. I think it's the nicest these altars look in many years. Yeah. It's different colors. It's really quite, quite nice. Is this on? Yes, it okay. is. Fine. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Here. Here we are. New Year. A new month. A new week. And also a new day since yesterday. Last night, many of us watched the clock to observe the very moment when at the stroke of midnight we were in a new year, a new day. In Jesus' time, a rabbi wanted to know when his special day, his Sabbath, started, and that was on a Friday afternoon, he would hold up two strings, one being very light in color and the other dark. When the sunlight grew too dim to distinguish which string was light and which was dark, he knew that his Sabbath had begun. We Christians celebrate our special day on Sunday because as Luke writes in Acts, on the first day of the week, we gather to break bread. And Paul tells the Corinthians to set aside a sum of money for the poor on the first day of every week. These instructions, coupled with the knowledge that our Lord had been resurrected on a Sunday, led early Christians to call Sundays the Lord's Day. Today, Sunday, January 1, 2012, we celebrate the Lord's Day. What a great way to start the new year. A brand new Lord's Day. A brand new year, a brand new beginning. If you made resolutions last night, hopefully you're not repeating failed New Year's resolutions of past years. Let's make and practice higher goals. Above all, as Christ taught, let's really care for and love each other. Also, on the very serious side, the New Year is a great time for us to remember each and every day that very basic truth that Satan was defeated at the cross. When he talks to us, he talks like he was the victor. He was not. He was defeated at the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I usually get some amens on that. Amen. Good. There's somebody out there. Boy, his lights are hard bright. I told you. Yeah, right. It's not fading my jacket. Is it? No, you're good. This Christ is on our side. At times during our life's journey, we sometimes forget that fact. What a wonderful feeling of confidence it should give us. The Lord of the universe is on my side. And he chose me. He's on your side. He chose you. God loves you. God loves me. It is not that we love God, but that he loves us. And God has a future for each and every one of us. We need to claim the promise that God made to the children of Israel and to us. In Jeremiah, God told us that I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare, for peace, and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> Many years ago, Martin Luther wrote, provide yourself with armor from Holy Scripture concerning justification, which takes place through faith. Collect, Luther says, a number of scripture lessons that ascribe righteousness to God. Then ask the Lord for their meanings. Then, if you put your reliance on these passages, you will be able to stand, even after a fall, after acts of slander, theft, murder, or any of the other sins that we commit. I know this is true, because I've been there. 
One passage that helped me was inspired by God to be written by the prophet Isaiah over 2,700 years ago. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let me ask you a question. Do you study the Bible? I don't mean, do you read it? I mean, do you study it? Do you have a specific time and place set aside to do this? Do you attend Bible classes with fellow believers? If your answer is yes, that's wonderful. If no, the question remains, why not? I have heard many preachers say that we have a famine in our land, not one of food and water, not one of churches and ministries, but one of the study of the Word of God. That's the B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. That always got a nice hand at the Bible School. Not here today. For a moment, picture in your mind a friend who is wrestling with some of the basics of belief in Christ. Perhaps he or she has experienced a sudden tragedy or crashing disappointment, or perhaps has heard a deceptive false teacher. Your friend, really struggling now, looks to you for help. Is your grip on Bible knowledge strong enough to help him? Can you point him or her in the right direction? The natural person isn't born with this kind of knowledge, but it can be acquired. You ask the Holy Spirit to assist you when you study the Word, when you pray, as you listen to the Word being preached on Sunday. Ask that the Holy Spirit become a real and relevant force in your life. Ask Jesus to show you what it means to have the Spirit of God reside within you. Ask for fulfillment of these words that I'm sure you've heard before. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. Yes, use us, Lord. But we know that our works won't get us into heaven. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, writes our name in the book of life by his grace, not by our works. Our works will not decide our eternal destiny. Through our works, God blesses and builds his church. Let's continue to hear the voice of the Lord calling us to repentance and greater service. In the November issue of our Lutheran magazine, Dr. Hain writes out, the Holy Bible can't help us when it's sitting on a shelf someplace. The authority of the Bible is in our encounter with it. That is, it is a communication event. To be effective, the word must be interactive, read and preached and heard and studied, struggled with and lived. This, I believe, is what Luther wrote about. We help others, thus help ourselves. Let's use this armor, this knowledge of God's <coughs> word. Even amidst the despair knowing that we have sinned, we also know that God is faithful, even though at times we are not. We must not forget that God is faithful and that he also promised that punishment would follow disobedience. Though I prefer to believe how God has promised future restoration and blessings to his people, even though they might be weak at times and follow the devil in his ways. But much over than that, prior to committing to sin, ask for Christ's help, and he will willingly respond. Confess your weakness to him. You have not, because you ask not. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, 
and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Pray earnestly for Father God's help. I don't mean to ask as many TV preachers tell you, that is, select and collect, but to claim and then proclaim. Claim the help that our God will provide all believers, then proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Lord, that Jesus Christ is our advocate, Jesus Christ is our sin sacrifice, Jesus Christ is our bread of life, Jesus Christ is our creator, Jesus Christ is our good shepherd, Jesus Christ is our high priest, Jesus Christ is our I am, Jesus Christ is the head of our church, Jesus Christ is our deliverer, Jesus Christ is our King of Kings. Jesus Christ is our Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is our gate. Jesus Christ is our light of the world. Jesus Christ is our rabbi. Jesus Christ is our true light. Jesus Christ is our rock. Jesus Christ is the Son of the Most High. Jesus Christ is the Righteous One. Jesus Christ is our King Eternal. Jesus Christ is truth. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega. He is the Son of the Father. He is the Mighty One. He is our Good Shepherd. He is our Great High Priest. He is our Deliverer. He is the Lord of all. He is the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah. Jesus Christ is our Savior. And that is why we claim, so that we can proclaim just who Jesus Christ is. When we ask our triune God, for the wonderful things that he has promised us, accepting them as joint heirs with Christ, as children of God. We claim, and then we proclaim. Well, how can we proclaim? What can I do to further this gospel that I profess to embrace? We as Christians know that faith without works is dead, that the blood of Jesus saves us with the result of the faith given to us by grace, allows compels us to do good works. The one certainty is that I cannot do them by myself. I ask Jesus to fill me with the Holy Spirit as he promised, and, and that this presence of the triune God within me, as with all believers, helps us to live as God wants us to live. As we work to build his church on earth, with all credit for our works, be credited to the Christ. By faith, we can have the Spirit's power each and every day of our lives. He empowers believers. He is present in the times of hardship. He is present in the times of danger and lack of self-confidence. He enables us to worship Him, the triune God. He transforms us from within. He helps us to understand and remember the Holy Bible. He gives us peace. He gives us that peace that transcends all understanding, as is stated in Philippians. We must rejoice in the Lord always. This I can testify, testify to from personal experience. Each and every day, the Holy Spirit gives me more peace than I had the day before. Ask Jill my wife, and I'm certain that she will tell you that I'm not the same man that I was just a few short years ago. Although both she and I know that though I've traveled quite a distance, I still have many, many miles to go. But with his help, I will travel them successfully. One asks, how can I receive this power? As I have said, ask Jesus for it. Claim it as a believer, and then anticipate his positive response. We Christians live by faith, as Paul wrote in Romans. In fact, as we face pressure and perhaps even persecution, if we stop our hectic lives for a minute, we can, I believe, that we can actually feel our faith grow. We can feel God's presence more clearly. We can commune with our fellow believers in our workaday world and with our brothers and sisters in Christ here at Trinity. We can grow in character and patience from our trials. As many a preacher has said, faith means resting in what Christ has done for us in the past, but it also means knowing what he will do for us in the future. 
Recently, I heard the story of a young man in Burma who at a Christian gathering was converted to Christianity. He knew that he had to tell others about this Jesus that had saved him from his deserved punishment. But how? You see, he couldn't read or write. His memorization skills were minimal. Then it came to him. He would ask the missionary who was teaching him about this Jesus to mark various passages in his Bible with a green marking pen. And this young man went into the streets of his hometown and would stop people and ask them if they would be kind enough to read the marked passages to him as he couldn't read. And then he would ask the stranger if he knew what this reading meant with the resultant dialogue between himself and the reader following more often than not. To me, this entire story shows us this Holy Spirit at work, allowing this man to claim and then proclaim. <coughs> Last month, I also read several articles in a magazine where the authors call for us Christians to invest our time, talents, and treasures in the world back to the God who created it. That is a real movement towards this goal that we mortals many times articulate, but usually follow up with very little action. Why do we wait until New Year's Eve, or perhaps after a near brush with death, to look at our investments of time, treasures, and talents? Scripture says that we could face ourselves face to face with the Lord at any moment. But I know that you know knowledge alone can be very dangerous. Knowledge, just for knowledge's sake, can be a heady thing and can turn into pride. God gives us his truth so we can put it into practice. It is not an end in itself. We need to balance his truth with love and grace and obedience. We would well to remember that the Jesus whose birthday we celebrate on December 25 is with us every day. We Lutherans believe that Jesus Christ will one day physically return and we need to be ready. The Lord is going to return and he doesn't wish that any of us should perish. As Dr. Swindoll has said, there are actions that reveal our readiness, including first of all, that we walk by faith, not by sight. Secondly, that we live in peace we view our present and our future not with panic. We don't live worried, hassled lives. And thirdly, we rely on hope that gets us through each day, knowing that he has gone before us and that he lives and we shall live also. One day Jesus will come for us. His coming is sure. He will keep his promise. He has conquered death. We believers will also. Soon we here at Trinity will be asked to put more of our time, talents, and treasures into the practice of the E in our ELCA name. We Lutherans are the good news Lutheran church. We are the gospel-based Lutheran church. But a pastor from Ohio was quoted in a recent Lutheran magazine, where are the verses from onward Christian soldiers and lift high the cross in our services. He asks if this absence of such songs reflects our growing disdain for military representation of Christ's church. Further, he tells us how our baptismal rites, rites calls on us to renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God and the ways of sin that draw us from God. Isn't that military talk? We need to be more forcefully tell the world who we are. Our Trinity Town Hall meetings have helped us to understand who we are. The organizational structure that has been developed as a result of these meetings by Trinity's leadership team is ready to roll so that we can tell others about Trinity and our Lord. As part of this community of saints, we as individual worshipers are now more conscious of our fellow worshipers and the understanding of Trinity's needs and mission. The mission of the church is mission. 
The mission of Trinity is mission. It can be a chain reaction with our energy and actions affecting others and their energy and actions affecting even more people. It can become a geometric progression. Let us pray that it will. Together as a congregation with God's help, we will be successful as we claim and then proclaim. Let me close with these words from the Lutheran Study Bible. When we gather with God's people on Sunday for worship, let us remember why we gather. We gather to celebrate the day of Christ's resurrection and the transformation of the Old Covenant in view of his life. We gather to receive his forgiveness and partake of his holy feast, the Lord's Supper. We recognize that gathering for worship is more than a law or custom one should keep. In the worship service, the Lord gives us his blessing. Sunday morning is a banquet prepared to sustain you unto life everlasting. May Yahweh grant us his shalom. Amen.